Hi everyone, welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to look at combinations with repetition. So let's dive into the first example. How many combinations of size 3 are there from this set S, consisting of the three elements A, B, and C, if we're going to allow repetition? So maybe a, a physical example of where such a problem could arise. Uh, you're out to dinner, uh, you, it's you and two of your friends, so there's three of you at the table in total. You'd like to order three platters of food, and there's three choices. There's the platter A, platter B, and platter C. And since you want to order three platters, you could order all three, A, B, and C, or maybe you have a, fr a favorite, so you want to double up on that one. So maybe two platters A and a platter B, or maybe one of them is really the favorite of all of you, and so you just order three platters A, or three platters of C. This is what we mean by taking a combination of size 3 from A, B, and C, where repetition is allowed. We could double up or even triple up on our choice. And here, if again we're thinking of the restaurant analogy, the order doesn't matter. You know, a platter A and two platters B, it doesn't matter if we place the order, oh, I'd like platter B, platter A, and platter B. No, the point is, is you're getting two platters of type B and one of type A. So this word combination here is an indicator that order does not matter. We didn't really talk about this before, but that's because anytime we talked about combinations or choosing, it was always how many ways are there to pick a subset of size k from a set of size n. And as soon as we talk about picking subsets, order doesn't matter. Order mattered when we talked about strings and permutations, but when we talked about choice in terms of how many ways can we choose a subset from a larger set, order didn't matter. But that's where this idea of a combination comes in. Ironically, the word combination in mathematics means that order doesn't matter, but in, in general language you have such a thing like a combination lock. Those are those locks you probably had on your locker when you were in secondary school. And there the order does matter. They're usually a three number combination and you have to get the numbers in the right order. Even though they call it a combination lock, that order matters, so it probably should have been called a permutation lock instead. But anyways, the idea is that when we see the word combination, it's an indicator that order doesn't matter. Okay, so how many combinations of size 3 are there if we're going to allow repetition? So one way we can do this is just list them. Now this is never our ultimate goal is to count by listing. Our ultimate goal is to count more like a professional and figure out how we can attach these new objects that we're trying to count with some objects we already know how to count and use our existing counting methods. But for getting a feel for what's going on, it's perfectly fine to start listing things to get a feel for what a particular example of a combination is, or multiple examples. So what could some combinations be? Again, if I think I'm at a restaurant and I'm ordering three platters, A, B, and C, I could make the choice where I order all three of them, and that's one possible combination. So we can think of this as one of each type. What else could we do? Well, we could double up on a platter. So maybe we'll repeat choice A. If we made two choices of A, we could follow that with either a B or the two choices of A followed by a C. Or we could double up on the Bs. I could order an A and two Bs, or I could order a couple of the Bs and a C platter. Notice I'm speaking as if I'm uh, thinking about this in terms of our physical situation of ordering platters uh, at a restaurant. Um, we don't need to think about that concrete example, so maybe I'll switch and now talk in terms of elements of the set. Uh, what else could we do? Well, again, we're doubling up, so we've looked at the possible ways of having two choices of the A's, two choices of the B's, but we could also select two C's, and then an A, or two C's, and then a B. And that's all our possible ways of getting 
one doubled up. So we're we're going two of one type. Now what else could we do? Well we could just select three of one kind. So we could go all A's, we could go all B's, or we could go all C's. And those are our three of one type. And that's really it. That's all the possible combinations we can have. And we listed them systematically, making sure we took one of every type, picking uh, one that we doubled up on, and then picking one that we tripled up on. And so what do we have in total? So therefore, there are a total of, if we count them all up, there are 10 combinations. Now, we did that by listing. Can we do this without having to list them? So that's our follow-up question. How can we count combinations with repetition in general? And the idea is to encode a selection as a binary string. So here's our answer. We will encode a combination as a binary string. So here binary strings are coming in again. They are objects we know how to count. So all we have to do is show how a selection corresponds to a binary string. So let's look at this particular example. We've got a few combinations up above. So maybe I'll put this as example here. We had this A, B, C selection, one of each type. How could I encode that as a binary string? Well, the way I'm going to encode it is I'm going to say, well, there's an, a natural order on the original elements I'm choosing from. So these are the elements of the set A, B, and C. So I'll stick them in some order and that's the order it is. So if it's a menu item, it's A is the first menu item, B is the second menu item, C is the third menu item. And that's just so I have a place to talk about my selection. So this ABC, if I imagine dividers, two dividers, what appears the, to the left of the first divide, divider is my selection for A. And I'll just put a zero in every time I select an A item. So I've selected one A item. And then to write it to the right of that first divider, the divider looks very much like a one. So to the right of that first one, I've made a selection of B. And then to the right of the second one, I've made a selection of C. So these represent my choices for the A's, these represent my choices for the B's, and these represent my choices for the C's, where the ones were my separators or my dividers. So just for example, if I said, uh, one, zero, zero, one, zero as my binary string. What does that correspond to as a choice? Well, again, what appears to the left of the first one is going to be my selection of A's. I don't have any zeros there. The zeros are just like markers. They're just like a stamp. Okay, there's, you know, here, because there's two zeros um, in between the two divisors, dividers, it's telling me that I've made two selections of the B's. Since there's no zeros in front of the one, it means I didn't select any A's. But what I did is I selected a B, a B, and then a C. So in short, what we really have here is we have a divider, a divider, and then what appears here, here, and here are the choices for our A's, the choices for our B's, and the choices for our C's. These are what we call dividers or separators. 
and I indicate my choices for my A's, B's, and C's because I want to in, in, um, be able to encode repetition. I just use zeros to indicate whether I've selected an A or not and how many I've used. So again, one last example. If I went A, 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 what does that correspond to? Well, it means that I've made a selection of three A's, then I've got my divider. What follows that divider is my selection for B's. I didn't make any, so there's no zeros there. And then I've got my divider for C's, and to the right of the C, I've got nothing written there, no zeros, because I didn't select any C's. So what we can see is that we are able to encode our selection as a binary string. And what are this what is the binary string? It's a binary string in three zeros and two ones. Two separators with three zeros because we are selecting a set of size three from it or a collection of size three from it. So what we have then is that there are how many binary strings of length five with two ones or three zeros? There are five, choose two comma three, which is five factorial, two factorial, three factorial, or in other words, five times, and then we've got the four, and then the three times two times one cancels with the three factorial in the denominator. We've got an extra two down there, so there are ten binary strings of length five with two ones, or in other words, three zeros. And so we've counted the number of combinations of size three that are from this set of size three by seeing that they can be encoded as binary strings and counting binary strings. Now all that remains is to generalize this is we just have to think of what the numbers are that are important for us. So if we look back up at the original problem, we are interested in choosing from three sets, or sorry, from three objects. And so because there's three objects, I can think of what's happening between them. Those are where I'm going to place the separators. So I'm going to place my separators there. And that means there's two locations to place separators. So there's going to be two ones in the binary string I use to encode it. And then because there's three objects that I'm choosing, there's going to be three zeros. So the place of the separators is that. So two ones is what we're interested in. And then this number here means that we are going to have a binary string with three zeros. So three zeros, two ones, or binary strings of length five with three zeros and two ones. Okay, so that basically gives us, through this concrete example, our general method for counting combinations with repetition. So we're going to let S be a set with n elements. That's essentially the menu items we can order. And we want to select k of those. So I want to order k objects off of that menu of n. And I can repeat. Like I can order two of the a platters, six of the b platters, and so on. So we are selecting k objects from n objects with repetition. So we'll prove this. We'll prove this now. And we're going to prove it much the same way we did that particular example. So how do we prove this? Well, we'll let S be the set of objects we are choosing from. So we'll label those elements A1 through AN. So now we've effectively ordered the elements of this set. The, the reason I need the ordering of the elements of the set themselves is so when I encode them as binary strings, I know what the first group of zeros represent, what the second group of zeros represent, and so on. So we've got S is our set of elements that we are picking from. Then each selection of k elements from S 
with repetition, so we're allowed to repeat our selection, can be represented as a binary string of length. So here's where we're going to have to do a little bit of thought, and we'll fill in that blank with some number of zeros and some number of ones. So we're just going to have to fill in these blanks. So again, the way we're encoding it as a binary string is we are imagining there are separators between the elements of s. Since there are n elements of s, there are n minus 1 separators. So those are the n minus 1 ones that we're going to be using. The zeros encode the elements that we're actually selecting. And so we are choosing k elements. So we're going to have k zeros in our string. And our string is going to consist of n minus 1 ones, k zeros. So in total, that's n plus k minus 1 is going to be the length of our string. So we've got those important bits of information now. How many binary strings are there? There are the number of binary strings of length n plus k minus 1 with exactly k zeros is given by that quantity there. There are this many such binary strings. So that's what we worked out in the previous lectures. So there's that many binary strings. And so there we go. We finished our proof. So this is our proof of the number of combinations with repetition using this binary string analogy. So encoding the information we want as binary strings, which we already know how to count. Let's look at an example, just so we can get a good feel for what this encoding is. We looked at it in the previous example, but let's do another example. So suppose we are looking at a collection of three objects, and we want to select seven, so that's our k value, with repetition. And let's suppose that our three objects are a, b, and c. Then how can we make the selection of seven of them? Well, I just want to do this encoding. So 7, we could say take A, 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 so that's three choices, and then we get maybe two Bs, so now that accounts for five things, and then two Cs. So there's one such selection of seven objects from those three objects where we used repetition. As a binary string, we would encode this as 0, 0, 0, 1, because those first bunch of zeros before the 1 are my selections of the A's. Then I've taken two B's, and then I've taken two C's. On the other hand, what if we did a 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, so that's five things, a 1, a 1, and then two zeros following. That would encode a selection. The selection it encodes is before the first one are all the A's. So that's one, two, three, four, five A's. And then between the two one are the B's. And then after the last one is the C's. So I've taken no B's, but I've taken two C's. So there's a selection. And as a final example, what if we wanted seven Bs? That was our selection. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Go ahead and write down the binary string. That would represent that encoding. And so in this case, there's no A's. So then we get our first one. Following that first one are all the Bs. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we get our other one. And then following that one are the Cs, of which there are none. So that encodes as the binary string 1000000001. Zero, 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 and so we can see this connection. 
that the number of binary strings of length 7 with exactly two ones and five zeros is exactly the number of ways we can choose seven objects from those three objects with repetition. All right, so now we know how to count the selection of objects with repetition. Let's see what we can do with this. So how many integer solutions are there to this equation? x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 plus x5 equals 10. As an example, one such solution could be 1 plus 0 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2 equals 10. So this is my x1 value, that's my x2 value, that's my x3 value, x4 value, and x5 value. So that's one type of solution. How many solutions are there to this equation? And we want integer solutions where the integers are bigger than or equal to zero. So what we need to do is try to connect this to objects we already know how to count. Now one way to do this is to say, I've got five menu items. Um, there's five menu items on the menu board at the restaurant I'm at, and I need to order 10 items off of that menu. So x1 is how many times I ordered the first menu item, x2 is my number of times I'm ordering the second menu item, and so on. So this is really about choosing 10 objects off the menu of five objects with repetition. So this is a way we can look at this problem and connect it back to choice with repetition. So the way we can write this up is as follows. A solution for x1, x2, x3, x4, x5 corresponds to a selection of size 10 from the set x1, x2, all the way up to x5, so the set of size 5, with repetition. So we're allowed to repeat some of our selections. And so why is that? Why does the solution correspond to a selection from this set with repetition? Well, the idea is the number of times xi is selected is just its value. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we look at the example above, and I again think in terms of this menu item, the example above was 1 plus 0 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2. So that solution I would interpret as I've selected x1 once, I selected the second menu item zero times, so that's the x2 is zero. I selected the third menu item four times, so that's why x3 is equal to four. So I'm selecting however many times I select that variable is its value. So x4 was, I selected the fourth menu item three times and I selected the fifth menu item two times. So that's what I mean by this last statement. The number of times xi is selected is just its value. So we've got now that the number of solutions to this equation is just the number of ways to choose 10 from 5 with repetition. So therefore, the number of solutions is the number of ways to choose 10 from 5 with repetition. And that is we are choosing 10 from 5 with repetition. So the formula is 5 plus 10 minus 1 choose 10 or in other words, 14 choose 10. And so that's how many solutions there are to that equation.
14 choose 10, which you can work out 14 factorial over 10 factorial times 4 factorial. That works out to some integer value, but I'll leave it as a binomial coefficient. This is how we want to express our answers in this course as binomial coefficients, uh, because it shows the thought process behind finding the solution. We could look at this in an alternate way. An alternate way, an alternate per perspective on it, but will ultimately have the same underlying properties, the same underlying construction. So here's the other way we can think of this problem. We can think of 10 ones and let's say four bars, which I'll make these really long bars. And maybe I'll make my ones a little bit more fancy. So more fancy ones with a little top and a, and a foot on it. So we can think of 10 ones and four bars. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and one, two, three, four bars. Now what I want to argue is that if I write down a permutation of these 10 ones and four bars, that corresponds to a solution. And any solution corresponds to a distinct permutation of these 10 ones and four bars. So how do we do that? Well, let's first write down that statement. Each solution corresponds to a permutation of these 14 symbols. And there are 10 of one type, 4 of another. Now you can kind of see where I'm going this. I'm permuting 14 objects, but they are two different types. 10 of one type, 4 of another type. There are how many permutations of these objects? Well, there are 14, choose 10, 4 permutations of those objects with repetition, which is also just 14, choose 10. So there's another way to think about it. I haven't really justified this correspondence. I said every solution corresponds to a permutation of these. So let's write down one of the permutations. Let's look at our solution that we have up above. Our solution was 1 plus 0 plus 4 plus 3 plus 2. That's our solution equal to 10. That can correspond to, I've got these 10 ones, so I will use one of them for the x1 value, then I'll put a bar, and then I'll use none of them for the x2 value, then I'll put a bar, and then I'll use four of the ones for the x3 value, and then a bar, three of them for the x4 value, and then a bar, and then two of them for the x5 value. And there's our correspondence. For any solution, we can write down this corresponding permutation using ones and the bars, and for any permutation of ones and bars, we can get back a solution. If you think about this, this is really the same ideas lurking in the background. Instead of ones and bars on the previous page, I used zeros and ones. Ones were my separators, zero my selectors. But the same idea here. So there's a couple of ways to think about it. In general, for any problem we do in this course, there's always going to be more than one way to think about it. And so I encourage you, as you work through problems, ask yourself, can I do this another way? What other ways could I do this? Could I think about it in a slightly different way and come up with an alternate solution? And the good news is, is that when you start to see these other ways of solving it, and you are able to solve it and get the same result, that's added confidence that your first solution worked because you got the same answer that you got using your second solution and possibly your third solution. And you also get to see how all these ideas are intermixed and intertwined and fit in together. So I highly encourage you to come up with alternate solutions for various problems. Let's look at the next example. 
How many integer solutions are there to x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 7? So here, you know, as an example, we could have 2 plus 3, that's less than or equal to 7. So x1 equals 2, x2 equals 3. So notice that we have the inequality, unlike that previous example where we had the equality. So how do we deal with an inequality here? Well, the fundamental rule of problem solving, if you haven't heard me say it before in a previous class or, or ever, or haven't heard someone else say it is, the fundamental rule of problem solving is if you don't know how to solve a problem, convert it to one you do know how to solve. We know how to solve the problem with the equal sign. We want to figure out how to solve it with the inequality. So the way we do it is we just notice that each solution, x1, x2, corresponds to a solution to x1 plus x2, and then I'll add an extra factor in here, an extra term. x3 is equal to 7. So what I'm doing is I'm introducing a third variable which is going to absorb the difference. If it was strictly less than 7, then I'll pad it with this variable x3 to get equal to 7. So for example, my solution 2 plus 3 less than or equal to 7, this would give rise to the solution 2 plus 3 plus, and then the extra padding I need there is another 2, which is equal to 7. So here's my x1 value, there's my x2 value. That's the same x1, x2 value I'm using here, except now I'm also throwing in an x3 value, which is the difference, to get equal to 7. So every solution to the original equation, x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 7, corresponds to a solution to this new equation where we've got it an equality there, equal to 7. And vice versa, every solution to this equation, x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to 7, corresponds back to a solution of x1 plus x2 less than or equal to 7. You just throw away the x3 value. And that's because there's a less than or equal sign in the original equation. So how many solutions are there to this? By the previous result, by the previous example, there are, you know, we can think about it in terms of selection. I want to form seven. I've got three variables. So I want to select these from these three variables. I want to select seven of them with repetition. The number of times I select the variable is the value I'm going to give that variable. So I want to select from these three variables, I want to select seven of them with repetition. So it's the number of ways to select seven from three with repetition. And so that's going to be nine, choose, seven. And we could you know, write down the value of this. That's nine times eight times seven factorial all over seven factorial. So that's why I didn't write the seven times six times five because it canceled. And then also over two factorial, or in other words, nine times four. And nine times four is 36. So that's how many solutions are there are to that inequality where x1 and x2 are bigger than or equal to zero. How about this next example? How many ways are there to distribute five apples, four oranges, and three pears to three people? So I'm going to think about in terms of baskets. And so I'll give these baskets uh, the names of the people that they correspond to. So this will be you know, person A, person B, and person C, and just to give them names, maybe we'll call this person Ann, Bob, and Cam. And I want to distribute five apples, four oranges, and three pears. So I could, for example, apples, I could 
go apple, apple, apple. And now I've got two apples left. Maybe I'll throw an apple in each of B and C. I've got a four oranges. Maybe we'll go an orange here, two oranges, and an orange. And then I've got three pears. Maybe we'll go pear, no pears, and then two pairs in the end. So that's one possible way to distribute the pieces of fruit. Now there's no condition that says each person has to receive one of each type. Uh, in fact, there's no condition at all. Someone could get no fruit and someone else could get all the fruit. There's many different ways to sort of distribute these pieces of fruit. We wanna count them all. So how do we do that? Well, what we can do first is we can just think of the apples. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to think of not as distributing the apples amongst the people, but I'm going to think about this as a choice. You've got five apples. So the apples are going to choose who they're going to. That means the apples have to choose five names of those three with repetition. So in this case, the apples have chosen Anne, 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 Bob, and Cam. So what we have is that the number of ways to distribute just the apples is the number of ways to select five from three with repetition. Again, why five from three? I'm imagining the apples are selecting five names from the list of three names and they're allowed to select with repetition. So they selected Ann, 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 Bob, Cam. And that's how the apples got distributed. How about the oranges? Same thing. The oranges are selecting, in this case, they're selecting four names from the three with repetition. In this case, they selected Ann, Bob, Bob, and Cam. And the pairs, they're selecting three names. They selected Ann, in this case, they selected Ann, Cam, and Cam. And so we've got all the information we need to piece together now. So again, we'll go back to the statement I just wrote down. The number of ways to distribute apples is the number of ways to select five from three with repetition. And so therefore, there are, we are selecting five from three with repetition, so that's plus five minus one, ways to distribute the apples. And we've got similar results. Similarly for oranges and pears. And I'll write down what I mean by similarly. So therefore, the number of ways to distribute the fruit is the number of ways to distribute the apples, which is three plus five minus one, choose five, times, because what we're doing is we're doing task A, distributing the apple, and then we're doing task B of distributing the oranges, and task C of distributing the pears, so because we're doing three tasks and we're doing them all, so ands, then this is a rule of product. There's the number of ways to distribute the apples. We're gonna multiply by the number of ways to distribute the pairs. The pairs, to distribute them, we are selecting four names from the list of three. So we are choosing four from three with repetition. And then we are selecting three names from the three with repetition for the pairs. So three from three with repetition. And we can do a little bit of simplification here. This is three plus four or seven, choose five ways to distribute apples times six, choose four ways to distribute the, the uh, oranges times 
five choose three ways to distribute the pairs. And so I will indicate that here. This is the ways to distribute the oranges. This is the ways, number of ways to distribute the pairs. And this was our apples. And so there we go. So we used a few things in this example. We used combinations with repetition, but then to piece things together, we also use the rule of product. All right, let's look at the next example. So in this next example, there's some code segments. This one has the code segments written in C. If you're looking at the notebook, I've got the Python code segments right next to it. In my slides here, I put those on a separate page. I'll go ahead and look at the Python code segments here. So we've got these Python code segments. There's some nested loops. And what we want to do is we want to figure out how many times this line called counter is executed. So this line right here, how many times is that line executed? So counter starts at zero, then we've got an outer loop, a middle loop, and this innermost loop, and they keep looping around. We get counter every time the, the line counter gets executed, it updates the counter by adding one to it. And I want to know how many times does that line run. In other words, what is the value of the counter after all the loops have executed? The next code segment below is just a, a slight modification. So we'll do the first code segment. And then we will see how to do the second code segment after. Okay, so a couple of things to note with Python, if you're not familiar with it. Python's range means that i in range from 1 to 21 means that it's going to run over the i values starting at 1 and going up to but not including the last number in the range command. So it goes up to 21 but it doesn't include it. So that means the last one it includes is the number right before it, which is 20. So that line says that i is going to range over 1 to 20. This one says j is going to run over, range over the values from 1 to 20. And this one's k is going to run over the values from 1 to 20. So what we notice is that line star is executed for every triple i j, k with i less than or equal to 1 to 20 uh, and j between 1 and 20 and k between 1 and 20. So that line will execute for every value of i, j, k, for every triple I should say of i, j, k, where i is between 1 and 20, j is between 1 and 20, and k is between 1 and 20. So the number of times that line is executed is just the number of triples. So what we have then is the number of times star is executed. That's equal to the number of triples. I, J, K, where I, J, and k, just because I'm running out of room here, I'll write them all in one line, live between 1 and 20. And so how many triples are there? Well, there's no conditions on i, j, and k other than the fact that they are some numbers between 1 and 20. So there's 20 choices for i, 20 choices for j, 20 choices for k, and so there's 20 times 20 times 20, or in other words, 8,000 different triples. And that means that line is executed 8,000 times. So the value of the counter after this loop is run, or these nested loops have run, should have a value of 8,000. Let's actually go ahead and check this and see if this is the case. So here I've got our code segment 1 all inputted. We'll go ahead and we will run it. So I've just executed that code block, and now we'll get it to spit out the value of the counter. And there it is, the value of the counter is 8,000. 
So we calculated this and now we've verified it as well. Let's go ahead and look at the next code block. So in this case, we again want to look at what's happening with this line star. And here we have that line star is executed for every triple i, j, k with now what are our conditions on i, j, and k? Let's go back and look at the code. Again, i is ranging over the values from 1 to 20. But j, as we enter in the j loop, it starts, j starts at the i value and then runs up to 20. And then as we enter into the k loop, k starts at the value j and then goes up to 20. So these are no longer starting at 1 all the time. And so what we have is that line star is executed for every triple i, j, k with i bigger than or equal to 1, but j has to be bigger than or equal to i, and k has to be bigger than or equal to j, and that's got to be less than or equal to 20. So now there is some more restrictions on the triples that we have. The triples have to appear in increasing order i has to be less than or equal to j has to be less than or equal to k. So how are we going to count that? So now we want to count these triples. So what we have is that the number of times star is executed is equal to the number of triples i, j, k where i, j, k are increasing. And how many of those are there? Well, let's just think what, what we can do to figure out how many of such triples there are. Well, one way to think about this is, so I got a list of numbers, 1 to 20, so that set of numbers from 1 to 20. If I select three of them with repetition, then those are going to form a triple that line star will have executed on. So for example, if I selected the numbers 10, 5, and 10, for example. So if I select these, then the triple that they would correspond to for which the line would have executed is 5, so i equals 5, j equals 10, k equals 10. So for every selection of three objects with repetition from the numbers from 1 to 20, they correspond to a unique triple that that line would have executed on. So that's the observation I have. So uh, maybe I should back it up and just say, what are some triples that the line won't execute on? Well, when I make this selection, how many ways could I arrange 5, 10, or 10, 5, 10? You know, if I think about all the different ways I can arrange them, there's only one arrangement for which the first number is less than or equal to the second number is less than or equal to the third number, and that's the arrangement I wrote down here, 5, 10, 10. So the idea is I'm using this unordered structure, selecting three objects from 1 to 20 with repetition, because there's going to be an order forced upon them for which that line star would have executed. It's the order in which they are increasing. So I've just made the connection that the number of times star is executed is the number of triples that appear in increasing order, and this is the number of ways to choose. In this case, it's three from 20, so three numbers from the 20 listed, where we're allowed to repeat numbers, so with repetition. And how many ways can we choose three from 20 with repetition? Where we're going to choose three from 20 with repetition. And so that's going to be 22 
choose 3. What's 22 choose 3? Do a little bit of simplification. A 2 cancels with a 2 and a 20 to leave me 10. A 3 cancels with a 3 and a 21 to leave me 7. 22 times 7 is 154. 154 times 10 is 1,540. Let's go ahead and check this. So there's our code segment. We'll execute it and then find the value of the counter, 1,540, exactly what we thought it would be. So there's a couple of exercises I've left for you at the end. Some time, ponder this, work it out yourself. I'm certainly more than happy to talk about these problems and the exercises during office hours. So take some time to work on this and see what you can find. So that's it for this section. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you again next time.